welcome to Running for Office panel discussion. I'm Marge Albright, a member of the local League of Women Voters. Each spring, Grafton has an election. There are seven elected boards with terms and expiration of terms defined by our charter. This panel discussion replaces a workshop the local league has held for the last three years to help candidates prepare for campaign painting. The audience for this discussion is candidates and their teams who have already decided to run and have pulled papers, those deciding whether to run, and those just curious about local campaigns. Before the panel begins discussing, please enjoy a short video about the League of Women Voters. Every great dream begins with a dreamer. Um, our panel is currently elected board members. This discussion will be very informal. Since I have never run for office, I use this guide um, where appropriate to focus the discussion. The guide has been sent to the candidates and is available on the local league website. Okay, panel, who are you? Peter, you first, then Dave, and, and then Raul. Peter? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Albright. Uh, my name is Peter Carlson. I am the chair of the Grafton Select Board. Okay, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Like, how did you become involved in government? Hmm. That's a great question. Um, local government runs, it runs in our DNA here in our family and our community, um, dating back to my grandfather in the 40s and my uncle in the 70s and my father, uh, my aunts, my uncles. Um, and it started with me here in Grafton back in 2004 when there was an opening on the cable TV oversight committee, which oversaw uh, Grafton's cable TV franchise license uh, and was, you know, basically a, a group of volunteers who just oversaw the Grafton public, public access to you. Um, from there, uh, I became uh, a member of the Grafton Charter Review Commission in 2006, and that was the first time I've ever chaired a committee. 
uh, and I had the distinct pleasure in that committee to work with a diverse bunch of people from a, a member of the board of selectmen, uh, member of the planning board, member of finance committee, um, and a few other members at large. And our job there was to review our town charter, which is every 10 years. Um, after that, I served on a number of ad hoc committees. Uh, one of them was the IT oversight committee. And then that's when I uh, took my papers out for my first run in local office in 2009, uh, where Rahul sits today, uh, which I was a member of the Grafton School Committee for 10 years. Um, and up until my, uh, my 10th year, after my fourth term for real, uh, my, my fourth term, beginning of my fourth term, I uh, opted to run for the select board. We were facing um, a lot of interesting challenges in thought having someone with my background um, who um, had a lot of knowledge of just where the school budget is and how that operated and what the needs were was uh, important for Grafton uh, to, you know, to have a representative who understood those uh, ins and outs. So as you can see, I've, I've kind of <laughs> bridged my career there for about 15 years or so. And uh, I've been on various other ad hoc committees uh, in between, you know, during my tenure on school committee and served as representatives for school, uh, other ad hoc boards for school committee and as well as uh, select board. This is a reference I often suggest to people because as you have said, there are lots of committees and commissions that you have served on and I counted over 60 that are listed in here and there are reports on each of those. So this is something good for candidates to look at, but also if you're considering being a candidate, participate. <laughs> it's a good thing. <laughs> um, I would like you to think about, and Peter, when we get there, because you've run many campaigns to talk about good, bad, you know, what was successful and what wasn't when we get to campaigning. And you have your, a value because you have such a breadth of experience. Dave. Okay, uh, Dave Robbins. I'm currently an elected member of the planning board, have been on the planning board since 2010. So I guess I'm coming up on 11 years on this board. Uh, I've lived in town for about 35 years. <clears throat> and it was within a year or two after moving to town that I got interested in uh, participating in the local government when we tried to uh, pass a water supply protection uh, uh, bylaw, a zoning district. Uh, and the first attempt of that uh, did not get enough votes at town meeting to pass, but that got me interested in, and I, I went, uh, went on to uh, you know, be a part of the committee that worked on revising that proposed bylaw. We got it successfully passed very nicely. Uh, from there, um, I moved on to, uh, the Conservation Commission, which I chaired for quite a few years uh, up through the mid 90s. Um, subsequently, in the early 2000s, I was uh, part of the committee that got the Community Preservation Act adopted by Grafton. Um, I served on the IT committee along with Peter for a while. I'm still on the IT committee, currently serving as chair of that committee. And I've yeah, been, I think, all together uh, uh, on at least a dozen different town boards and committees over the years. Um, I also unsuccessfully ran for Slackman back in 1989 and 1993. So uh, my, my participation in town electoral politics dates back to those efforts which weren't successful and I don't need to talk about them a whole lot now. It's a whole lot later and things have changed since the late 80s, early 90s. Okay. Uh, again, uh, your experience goes back and is broad and it uh, is not only in elected positions, but also as volunteers. It's amazing how many people volunteer in this community. And still, we need to enrich that pool of volunteers. I, I'm pretty sure that everybody is always clamoring for additional people on there. There, there are always openings. So Raul, you're our point of difference compared to these two guys. <laughs> Tell us about you. <laughs> I'm Rahul Rati, and I am a total newbie when I see Dave and Peter. I, I mean, this is my first committee membership. I never thought I would run for any committee, but when we moved to Crofton, we moved like uh, four years before I ran for the committee, and it's total five years now, almost close to five years now. So when, I, when we came here, we found Grafton to be very uh, welcoming town. It's uh, very quiet, very welcoming. 
and easy to go around kind of like everyone was very helpful and my first interaction was at the at the lady at the swirls and scoop and she welcomed me with a free ice cream so that that was amazing actually so four years down the line we i just thought of uh, running for the committee one of the reasons was that uh, i'm from south asia to be very precise i'm from india we hardly had any representation in the town. I did see one of my friends, uh, he was a select man in Worcester at one point. And uh, another friend of mine who ran for the planning board in, in Grafton. So that encouraged me to run for a committee. And why school committee? Because uh, I'm a scientist, I did my PhD and all, and I thought, with education background, I would fit into the school committee. So that was the reason I decided to run for the committee here. And that was last year. I have a three year tenure there. So let's see how it goes. Okay, good. Um, I am in interested in the fact that uh, sometimes we have um, nobody, no competition. There's no, you run all by yourself. Sometimes you have a lot of competition, sometimes you lose. And there's much to be learned from every campaign. So that's what we're gonna to try to get at is um, eventually, you know, what, what you guys have learned and can share with people who are running. Um, I'm going to kind of go, as I promised, I'm gonna go through the, the guide that we put together. Um, and we've talked about how to start. And of course, the, the first thing you have to do if you're gonna run, if you've decided to run, is to go to the town clerk and get their packet of information. And that's what's called polling papers. Uh, I'm dumbing it down here a little bit, but you can, you can jump in on this. <laughs> so um, this year is odd. Uh, last year had was kind of odd too, in that we started the COVID lockdown in March. So, uh, things were a little different then too. But I want you to specifically talk about that process of filling out the, pa the nomination papers. Does anybody want to jump in and say what you've done in the past and what you're going to do this year or, or what you're going to do the next time you run? Well, you don't know. You're, you're, hopefully, you guys will never have to do this in a pandemic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, uh, anybody want to jump in on on getting fifty signatures? I'll take a stab at that. Sure. So, I, I think um, in the past, in uh, you know, I think people can appreciate this was you know making that big decision to want to run for local office. I think that's the most challenging and the most exciting thing a candidate can do for themselves and their community. Um, you know, the the process in which that I did this back before pre COVID was you could either you know call your local town clerk. Um, and indicate your interest in running for that specific office, uh, or you would go down and see them in person, you know, when the appointments were available and you could just walk into the municipal, you know, our municipal center. Um, you know, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, they just take some basic information. Uh, the clerk uh, is extremely encouraging. Uh, they give you all sorts of uh, campaign finance forms and, and so on and so forth. And when they, everything is all ready, you go down and you sign off and you and you collect it and you walk away with, uh, you know, three sheets of nomination papers. And in Grafton, um, you know, the objective is to, you know, the objective requirement is that you need to get at least a minimum of 50 certified voters um, to, to meet that criteria. And I have to say that the, the clerk's office is extremely helpful in making sure candidates um, fill out and get the right information. So it's not questionable. And they, uh, you know, I'm sure Dave and Rahul can attest to this. They say, don't just get 50 signatures, try to fill as many as possible, but also don't wait to the very last minute. And I know Dave's going to laugh at me about that because I can share with you uh, an incident that I had during school committee. And maybe this is a great lesson for anyone else um, who'd be uh, watching this, but you want to turn those in, you know, in a decent amount of time. So that way, if there was any questions or any things that the clerk might say, like, yeah, I'm not seeing like these five people and you only got 53 signatures, you know, you've got time to go back and get, you know, at the minimum, you don't want to try to, you know, do all that work that you need, you know, um, and, and find out that you're, you're three or four short uh, to meet um, the requirement. 
So I'm, I, I would say that it's very straightforward to go down and, and get it. But like I said, the most difficult decision I remember when I ran for local office was making the decision, making the commitment to serve my community. This is the letter that comes from the town clerk's office and it includes dates. And that important date for people to submit papers is March 30th by five o'clock. Uh, and we recommend 75 signatures. Now, in the past, we also recommended that you go to the committee uh, that you're running for, <laughs> let them know that you're running and have them sign. People, people who are elected to office are more than willing to help you. Uh, it, it's not competition. It's just recognizing the need. Can uh, Raul or Dave, do you have anything to add to getting signatures? Yeah, I think you know. I would certainly emphasize the, uh, the 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 goal of getting seventy five or more signatures. I you know if if you can fill up all three sheets, you know, typically you get three sheets. I think I've heard some people this year say they've they've been getting seven sheets because of the difficulties in 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 getting you know sheets circulated. But you know you know in in a normal year, you know. Uh, at least for, for those of us who tend to go to a lot of meetings at the municipal center, you know, I, I think the last time I ran, I collected almost all my signatures just by going to meetings and, and passing the sheets around at, at meetings, um, you know, visiting a few of my neighbors. Um, you know, if if you, you know, it, there, it's it's harder if you don't have you know, some some places you can go. I think one year we had a. We had an event or something. I mean, we had, I don't I remember what it was offhand, but I remember getting you know, taking the papers there. And so, you know, if if you happen to be in places where there's lots of lots of Grafton voters, you know, it, it's kind of easy just to pass the paper around and collect a lot of signatures. Uh, I think the first time I ran for Selectman way way back when, I didn't know that many people in town, so it was a little bit more complicated. I ended up calling people and you know going to visit, which was kind of nice actually because. You know, visiting people not only to get their signature, but also to take the time to talk talk about your you know, what what you want to do as an elected position. Uh, so there's various different ways depending upon you know, the activities where you typically encounter people, and uh, you know I, I you know some in some cases people sit in front of stop and shop collecting signatures. I'm this year, jump of in. course, there's, yeah, this it's not going to happen. Town. Raul, you you had some of this last year, right? Right, so uh, initially I thought getting signatures was daunting because I was here only four years and I didn't know many people. But uh, I have to tell you, it wasn't difficult at all. I started with uh, Laura Often that she was she's school committee chair. And because uh, I decided to, as you said, meet every one of my other school committee members, I was attending the meetings. So I would just, uh, and Laura was, uh, she herself asked me, hey, where, where are your papers? I have to sign. And I was like, wow, that's easy. So I just uh, <laughs> had the papers in front of me and she signed and she was the first one to sign, start my campaign kind of. So after that, it wasn't that difficult at all. Once you get those papers pulled, the hardest part is pulling the papers to decide that you, you have to run. And then getting 50 signatures, I ended up getting 65. Out of that, only one was uh, disqualified, and I had 64. And what I did was, other than the school committee members, I went to the school principals, I talked to them, and I got their signatures. Then I went around in my neighborhood. And then someone suggested me, hey, you can just uh, stand in front of Stop and Shop and just introduce yourself, and everyone is happy to sign the papers. And it didn't take me too long to get 50 signatures. It wasn't that difficult at all. Karen, can you hear me? I wanted yes, her to jump in. I can hear in. you, <laughs> you, have, you ran for office last year and you had a very clever way of getting signatures. You wanna, wanna share that? Certainly. So um, I knew that I was going to be needing to, hold on, let me turn on my video if I'm actually talking here. All right. So yeah, once again, during the pandemic, so I sent an email out to many of the people I knew in town, asked them if they'd be willing to sign. I set up an afternoon and I drove around, left a uh, paper on someone's doorstep, stepped back, they signed it, I went and picked it up at the door. But yeah, it was, a, I think it only took me about two and a half hours or so, just going Congratulations around Congratulations and thank you. Yeah. I mean, that's the kind of 
cleverness, adaptability, we have to, uh, we've been, we're getting a little tired of it, but we'll, yeah. we'll continue on for a while. <laughs> Thanks, Karen. <laughs> okay. Um, and the other date that we have to remember is that the town election is May 18th. I have heard something about the town meeting changing in, but that doesn't change the election date. I'm assuming, and Peter, you may know better than I do, that that's the date. And I'm bringing that up because between turning in your nomination papers on Mar by March 30th, please do it beforehand and be kind to the clerk, <laughs> and, Mar and May 18th, that's called campaign time. And so we want to talk about campaign activities. Um, anything anybody want to say about campaigning? Sure. Um, as all of us have campaigned, I think we can all appreciate just how we used to do things and, and really took that for granted, being able to meet people in person. But uh, even a couple of years ago, uh, before COVID, when I was running for the select board seat, it was a contested seat. And I had to do a combination of a lot of things. I had to do a little, you know, I did a lot more social media than I've ever done before. Um, setting up a dedicated page and something on social media, whether it's Twitter, Facebook, uh, a YouTube channel, something that allows you to put your face with the name and the message. Uh, in addition to that, you know, being able to go around and meet people in person pre-COVID was extremely uh, helpful. But I can tell you, uh, I think we could all appreciate we've seen the uh, campaigns over last year. It was 100% through social media because of just everyone keeping their distance and respecting, uh, you know, keeping away from one another during the height of the, a lot of the unknowns during the pandemic. And I think, I think uh, it's important that uh, people start early and, and become aware and learn how to utilize these tools. They don't cost anything to the candidates um, to start. Uh, but having um, having a dedicated page where you can interact with people online uh, that's convenient for them, I think is super important. And if I may add, uh, when you're when you're preparing your your statements or you're preparing your comments on a specific issue, uh, I've learned to keep it under a minute and a half. I always learn that when people are looking at their yeah. mobile device, uh, anything over a minute and a half, two minutes, you're, you're going to lose them. So I always try to say, be as concise as possible, which Dave knows this about me personally is almost impossible. I can't be concise. <laughs> so, you know, these are, um, these are uh, challenges. Some people I think do it better than others, but I think it's important that uh, people start uh, with utilizing these tools because this pandemic is definitely going to still be here during the height of the campaign season in Grafton. Yeah. yeah, it's probably also fair to say that you know, even post-pandemic, um, social media is going to be one of the keys. I mean, yeah, as, as a candidate, uh, if you're you know, particularly if you're running a contested election, if if nobody's if if it's no contest, you know, you you don't really have to lift a finger. Uh, although it's nice. You know, Particularly if you're new, it's nice to uh, you know to do you know to get out there anyway, so people can kind of get to know you, uh, and it always helps. But you know, certainly in a contested election, uh, it's very important to connect with the uh, connect with the voters, and make sure you know, make sure that you're able to you know communicate with them. You know, I you know, certainly second Peter's advice on uh, keeping keeping the communication brief and to the point and as clear as can be. Listen to people. Try to understand what they're interested in, what you know, what their issues are. Uh, which uh, a lot of that was pretty successful last year during on social media. Uh, you know, just you know, thinking back, once upon a time, uh, the Grafton News was kind of our social media, and you know, most people in town read the Grafton News. You know, it's sort of what I see today on some of the Grafton Facebook groups reminds me of what we used to see in the Grafton News. So, I mean, things do change over time, but it's always important to, to understand what people are reading, where people are reading things, you know, what, what tools you can use to get in touch with people uh, and you know, communicate back and forth, find out what people are interested in. That is one thing I learned years ago, which I didn't do enough of. Uh, and when I ran for selectman all that time ago, it's, uh, I, I didn't take as much time as I needed to get in touch with people. So however you can do it, you know, given the constraints of the pandemic this year and you know, however things are going to be next year, keep up, keep up and understand what the most useful tools are and the multiple tools that you may need to use, multiple ways to reach people and talk to them and listen to them. 
but that's oh. that's kind of a constant, regardless of the details. What's, what's a constant is if you 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 want to you want to reach out to people and engage them. Right. So, Ron, we'll do yeah. I mean, I was not contested, so there was no one running with me. So, I mean, as Dave said, I didn't have to lift a finger. I, I did kind of. I I really did lift some fingers. So, uh, the, the main thing was as I as Margie also said, I talked to all the committee members, I started talking to the principals and they were all helpful. And they were also excited that uh, someone from our community was coming up. Plus uh, what I did, because when I started, there was no pandemic, but when the elections came and everything, then we were in the midst of the pandemic. By the time I got, got all my signatures, we were already in the pandemic. So the best thing for me was to write emails to whoever I knew. Uh -huh. That was one thing. And the second was the WhatsApp. WhatsApp helped me. And then all the people I knew, they introduced me kind of to the people they knew. So it was more of a chain reaction and everyone was uh, pretty helpful in that regards. Very interesting. I've heard a previous candidate say that um, she had um, somebody on her team would put would post something like every week, you know, there would be some new issue or something that she something that would every week she had something new for her campaign and so people could check in and have reason to forward it on, you know, the multiplier effect of social media, which you've talked about. Um, okay, so uh, social media is tough for me. Um, Got any recommendations on how you find somebody to help you manage your social media? You know, there are, I think, a lot of people who will help you volunteer uh, for your committee. And I think this is the important piece of, you know, having, uh, you know, a core group of people to assist you. Um, as much as it, it's you in the face of, 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 of social media, uh, you know, someone proofreading your content, uh, it's great to have a couple of sets of eyes and people who uh, support you and want to help you. It's amazing. If you ask people for help, they'll they'll want to help. It's 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 amazing. When I uh, when I ask people for help, uh, they 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 like absolutely. What do you need me to do? I said, can you proofread uh, some of my messages? And I was like, absolutely. And same thing. Like, how would you do this on social media? Like, how do I release like pre-record a video and a message? But then you know, here's the technical piece. And you got to get into the weeds here. But how do you release it like at 5:30 p.m. tomorrow afternoon? Uh, there are a lot of people out there who who will be willing to help you. Um, I think it's important to to find not one, but you know, a couple of people who understand and how to, who know how to use social media. And I will say this, that having people be multiple admins of your social media accounts is extremely important. Um, you know, one wrong click of a setting or, or something like that. The last thing you want to do is, you know, create, create spam for somebody, but also have someone spam your message as well and they get lost. Uh, and all of a sudden, you, you know, your message is not really the important piece. It's the it's the spammers, you know, so, you know, probably earlier on, you remember people Zoom bombing, you know, coming into uh, Zoom meetings, you probably read about that six, seven months ago. Uh, that's what you really want that help with is help managing and making sure that, you know, uh, you know uh, something like that won't occur. I've also heard some negatives um, in that somebody got a hold of somebody's uh, social media thing and, and started harassing them. And I don't know how to deal with that. Um, and has anybody else heard about that issue where a candidate was harassed because of their social media. Good. I can think, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, you know, it made me think about this because I think we've seen some of this in, in the national politics, right? And it does happen at the local level. Um, I think this is where, you know, you're going to get people who are going to be hyper engaged. They're going to be uh, whether, you know, positively or negatively. Okay. And, and here's the thing, you're not going to please everybody with your message, right? And I think this is where it really comes down to just having uh, some good, you know, mental callus built up to be able to just, you know, block that out. This is the, that's that's the that's a minority that is causing and becoming, you know, the theme of a message. Um, I think it's important uh, to uh, you know have people to help support you on social media so that when those types of things do occur. And I'm not saying when, but you know, it, it's not a matter of if, it's when, right? 
um, that you have people who can just kind of layer the, the messaging and, and remind people like what, what this is about and not about something that it's not. And I think that that's the uh, important thing. I do think it's great having some debate, you know, and having people kind of share their points of views. But as you, as you have seen, it's all right that over time, some people can kind of take that a bridge too far, right? Um, and it's having some controls and some things in place to, you know, perhaps moderate that to keep it appropriate to the message and those things that are not appropriate. Um, just have a policy on your social media page that says that right up front. That way it doesn't come a shock to somebody if, if you have to remove a, a very inappropriate message. Wow, a lot to consider. Yeah. Um, <laughs> At Grafton News used to be where we went and that's where we would submit letters to in support of candidates. I think that still happens, but are there other ways that people can write letters of support to you, you that you have thought of or tried? Well, besides the Grafton News these days, uh, Jen Pelosi's Grafton Common is uh, is a good, it's, it's much more locally focused than the Grafton News has become. Yeah. Uh, for better or for worse, the, the Grafton News still is the Grafton News, to, uh, and, and you know, although not everybody pays attention to it, some people still do read the Grafton News. So, you know, you know uh, among the places you consider putting on, particularly letters of support, um, Grafton News and Grafton Common are the two places that I'm most familiar with where it's still, it, it, it makes sense. A lot of people read those, uh, you know, things, you know, things have changed over the years, but you know, those are those are still two news outlets that you know fairly effectively function as local news outlets for this town. And I've heard it said that you need to make contact with the people who are important to can to elections. And if you can get significant people to write letters, that helps. Am I naive or is that true? I think that's still true. I would okay. agree that's 100% true. And I think another news outlet to, uh, to what Dave had mentioned is the Community Advocate has begun mm. you know, writing some interesting articles for us. And you know they're located right in Westboro, but I also think getting out to as many news media outlets because not only they still do in the print media with the exception of uh, uh, Ms. Peluzzi's Grafton Commons site, um, but they also all do electronic as well. So I, you know, I, I think Community Advocate might be a a really good untapped resource for some people. A lot of people in Grafton get that, and uh, that, that's a great area to look at for you know, kind of bridging off the you know the Grafton News and, and the Grafton Common. In fact, that kind of reminds me that that now more so than it used to be, there are several several media outlets that you need to pay attention to. We've, we've discussed social media, and social media is more than just Facebook and Twitter. There are there are various other various other yeah, less well-known social media. I think next door is one that I'm, I, I, I'm not on, but I have heard about that. Some, you know, some people in Grafton are, uh, you know, you know, very, you know, very much participants in next door. Uh, Raul mentioned WhatsApp. That's more of a you know, one-to-one, uh, more of a, and I don't know much about that either. Never having used it. There is the Grafton News, Grafton Common, the Community Advocate. Um, I'm remembering from the old days, there used to be the Blocks and Valley Tribune, which we use a lot, uh, yeah, but there weren't as many different outlets in the old days as there are now. So it's it's helpful to be aware of all of them, uh, and and you know, try, you know, try to try to use use everything that has the potential to reach uh, a, a substantial set of voters in this town. Yeah, I think next door you mentioned it's a very novel idea because uh, it comes as an email to you, and anything you post on next door comes as an email eventually. And then it comes after one week, it comes as a digest. So you you do get to see whatever you write. That, that's a brilliant idea, actually. We can get back to social media whenever something pops into your head. Uh, but I want to also discuss lawn signs. Any thoughts? I, I agree. Lawn signs are important. Um, it's a It's a visual reminder that there's an election coming up. Um, I think once you start seeing lawn signs, that that means it's like everyone at Grafton knows <laughs> it's election season. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's, you know, some people might say signs don't vote, but I do believe having signs up is extremely important. 
for that visible reminder that you are a candidate, you are extremely interested in running for this position uh, and wanting to serve your community and it reminds people to come out and vote. Yep, I, I, I second that. I mean, yeah, yes. You know, uh, how many times we've heard this over the well, lawn signs don't vote. And so yeah, you, you really can't gauge a candidate's level of support by the number of lawn signs that are out. But having your name visible to people who are driving around town uh, is certainly valuable. You know, and uh, you know, those of us who've been around for a while, we've probably seen some lawn signs that uh, are, are easy to see while well, you can see the candidate's name. Occasionally we'll see someone come out with long signs that have slogans and phone numbers or website addresses on them. And you're driving by, you're not gonna read yeah. that. So when you're thinking about lawn signs, you do want to think about uh, keeping, uh, again, going back to Peter's earlier talk about, you know, you know mentioning, you know, what, when you're talking to people, keep it simple. Uh, when you're thinking of a lawn sign design, uh, think in terms of what you want the people to see when they really only have time to glance at it. So a design of lawn signs is a bit of an art in itself. And I love that we have people named often and the idea yes. of you can make a sign that says vote often. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyhow, um, but there I have been- I can add Mars to the lawn sign thing. One of my friends, uh, he said, I vote for the candidate who I, whose lawn signs I see more. So it, wow. it, it's funny, but because the thing is, we don't really get to talk to all the candidates. We don't know their history and anything about them, but we do go to, to the election and we see, oh, he's the one or she's the one who had more signs or let's say whose signs came across my drive through or whatever. So they end up voting for them. Uh, I don't know if it's a good thing or bad, but uh, from that, I take that lawn signs are pretty important. One of the other things that the league has taken to recommending uh, locally, because if we, we have people like Peter and David who run again and again, is make them so that you can reuse them. <laughs> you know, don't don't make it 2020 or 2021 or whatever. <laughs> vote for change. Uh, vote. Vote for change, vote for Dave. Well, Dave's been in office for 20 years and you want to vote for me for change? <laughs> there you go. And then the issue becomes how many signs? Oh, I will say this. I, I could tell you uh, from someone who's run campaigns and, and Dave can attest to this. You think, you, you think, um, you think 200 signs is enough. I'm, I'm just gonna throw a number. I'm not saying you have to get 200 signs. I'm just saying you always think 200 signs enough until you run out and you've got weeks before the election and you've got 75 other people asking for signs. And then it's like, oh, do I go out and get more? And then, you know, that it, it this is where I think the, the sign design, much to what you were saying earlier is an art, Dave. I also think knowing how, me, how much the number that you need is also an art. I will say this, every most candidates who I've helped in the past for lawn signs, they've ordered over 200 at the end of the day. And that was, uh, that they were re-upping from the original 175, 150 they originally had ordered. And then they order another 50 or another 70 or 100. And I'm telling you, it goes, it goes north over 200 very quickly. And I don't know if Dave, you, uh, I think you and I have helped some other candidates run in the past. Yeah. Yeah, yeah by, I, in the campaigns I've been involved in recently, uh, I don't, I don't recall the specific number of signs that they've uh, put up, but I think it's been north of 200 generally. Seems like a lot, but it's a big town. <laughs> yeah, it, I'll tell you, the town is substantially larger than it was when I ran my campaigns back in 89 and 93. Uh, and then also the issue of having camp volunteer sign holders. Good, bad. I think yeah. it's great. Uh, you know. Has the screen frozen for anyone else or just me? We're fine. Oh, everybody just came back on my screen. Okay, oh. just checking. <laughs> Hi, Karen. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> she's um, our master she's our master <laughs> we have um we've had uh several times where you know we would coordinate um having volunteers come down so having a, an online sign up is extremely helpful 
Some people come down 15, 20, maybe 30 minutes, hold signs. I'm one of these people always have some coffee available because you're down there. It's usually in the morning, it. it's usually in the weekends. Uh, but I will say having it outside of the weekends is extremely important. I think having uh, sign holdings throughout the day in different areas of town, which get different traffic patterns, I think is also very important because not everyone who travels through Grafton, you know, travels along that area of Route 122 and 140. Um, there are other areas uh, that have uh, a large amount of traffic that I think, you know, are gray areas um, to stand uh, down in South Grafton uh, over by uh, the um, old uh, fire muster house right there by the Cumberland Farms. Perfect location. Um, there's some areas up in the center of Common. I don't see people holding signs up at the Common very often, but I have on occasion seen a few people who've done that or have held in front of Stop and Shop. I think it's important uh, to have sign holders, but I also think it's extremely important to have it very well organized. And this is where having a team of people help you yes. um, organize. This is important to have. If you think you can do this all by yourself, it's a full-time job if you tried to do it all by yourself. Yeah, I can't emphasize enough the importance of having a, having a team of people you can count on. I mean, if you have, uh, if you're organizing sign holding events, maybe two or three times a week, you know, in different locations, uh, you can't count on having the same people uh, doing your signs every every time, every place. So, you know, have, having a number of volunteers that are willing to help you out. Maybe somebody's available on a Saturday, but not on a Wednesday, or vice versa. Uh, somebody who can make it one week, not so wet, not the next week. You know, ha having having people who are willing to help you out there is very important. And uh, having that organized, having somebody who will somebody who will coordinate that, you know, keep keep track of who's signed up for when, uh, you know, very important. Photography is on the list, and um, that would be important for social media, I'm assuming. And the idea is to have your friends and neighbors to help you get a professional look on your campaign material. <laughs> Um, and it doesn't have to cost a bundle. We can do an awful lot with phones and you know whatever digital cameras have made that pretty inexpensive. Um, I want to get, and I'm willing to change the subject. And you, you guys are doing great. You're coming up with lots of good things, but some people stumble on things like campaign finance. Uh, one of the first things you as a candidate need to do if you're going to if you're going to have to actually spend money on your campaign is create a campaign committee and uh, find a treasurer. Now, the thing that trips a lot of people up you know, over the years that I've you know, been involved in campaigns or helping campaigns is your treasurer cannot be someone who is a municipal employee. So. Uh, a lot of us, you know, we have the, the most of the people we know are active in you know, town boards and committees uh, or, or work for the town. And the, those people aren't allowed to be a, uh, a, your campaign treasurer because they're not allowed to, as a municipal employee, they're not allowed to solicit or accept contributions, political contributions. So picking your treasurer, you got to pick someone who who is not not otherwise involved as a volunteer or a municipal employee. Um, then of course comes the problem of raising money. It comes the problem of trying to figure out how much money you're going to need yep. and uh, you know and raising money. Asking people to donate money to your campaign is always I, I always have a hard time with that. Fortunately I haven't had to do that recently, but uh, yeah, I, I, I'm I'm not a, I'm not real comfortable asking people for money. I, I would agree with Dave um, that campaign finance, raising money, um, you know, finding someone who's done it before and just asking for the advice on how they do it. Any one of us would be more than happy to share like what we had to do and what we had to go through to Dave's point, you know, finding a, a treasurer who's going to have to sign off on this is extremely important. Um, and that's where I think you got to find someone who you absolutely trust will make sure that they, they do that for you. And you got to turn that report in, uh, right? You know, I believe, what is it? So many days before the election, Dave, and then there's uh, a final report after the election that you have so many days to file a report. And let me tell you something, yep. the town clerk, by the way, can, it will assist you 100% in making sure that you file all of the right paperwork, you have the right exhibits. They're not just going to take it and say you're on your own. Our Grafton has been historically, and they continue to do so, help out the candidates um, that are using uh, 
you know, uh, campaign contributions, making sure that you file the right types of forms the, in the right areas and providing the right exhibits to back up that data. I was kind of lucky I didn't go for a campaign and I didn't ask for finances. But as Dave said, I don't feel comfortable asking for money. But uh, like Peter said, if, I mean, you don't have to ask. If you have someone who you can trust, they ask for you, it's easy for them and it's easy for you also at the same time. So if you have a team, of course you need a team, the campaign team and you, there someone asks for finances for you, it definitely helps. And uh, certainly the, when you say over 200 signs, that's a that's a chunk of cash right there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Um, we've talked a lot about publicity. Um, and one of the things that we've suggested is that the words matter. And Dave, you've, uh, Peter, you've talked to this a lot um, and how you have to craft your position and you know say it so that it, it reads clearly. Um, okay, publicity we've talked about uh, press releases, attending events, um, getting support from friends and neighbors, all of this in the COVID land. Um, other, um, we have a League of Women Voters Candidates Night and for the life of me, I can't find the date right now. Um, it's in April before the election and everybody, I, it was sent out on, on information to the candidate, the people who have pulled papers and I'll continue to do that. But it's also important for the general public to know about it because we will be taking questions from the public before that time, which is very important. And I don't know what we're doing for contested and non-contested um, um, seats because papers don't have to be in for a while yet. So there are at least 10 people who have pulled papers, but I don't know how many more will. So we don't know what's going on for contested or not contested. Uh, but nonetheless, League of Women Voters Night is important. Um, you guys wanna talk about that or candidate night? Sure, I wanna say I've, uh, I've tried to attend them in person annually almost every year, um, the exception of last year where I uh, attended uh, via, well, I watched it after the fact, you know, it was a replay. Um, it's one of the few areas where people can see candidates think on the spot. And I think that that's important yeah. too. Although it doesn't, you know, I will say this, that don't be afraid to, you know, put your views out there for that. It is, you know, you've got a minute, a minute and a half to answer your questions and everyone has to abide by those rules. But I really think it's a great exercise because there's going to be times when you as an elected person are going to be put in a very similar situation. And I think it's a, uh, it's great opportunity for, for candidates to be able to on the spot be able to answer answer questions, um, I think it's fantastic, and it's uh, I still think it's relevant and useful today. Oh, what a beautiful sun is coming in on my face! It's great. <laughs> okay, anything more on candidates' nights, experiences, or wish lists? I haven't attended any, so I don't think I can add anything to that. Okay, we'll see you there this year. Or we'll be zoomed this year too. Okay, other tips. Um, I think this one you've talked around. Generate a timeline to organize your events. Those that you control, such as letters to the editor or whatever. Those you can not, not such as candidates night and use the election time published on the town website for the basis of your scheduling. Um, what do you think? Can't you just wait until the last week? <laughs> <laughs> Being yeah, it it, it, it kind of helps to have you know, to have things planned out um, because there, there's a number of things you have to plan for um, you know, signs for example uh, you know signs signs go up 30 days before the election so you, you know, if, you, if you want your signs to be out there and um, as early as possible you know you work back from the election date you count back 30 days and then you count back from there and figure out, figure out the lead time to get your signs printed and shipped to you. And working back from there, you got to factor in the time to design the signs. Uh, similarly, for any other campaign material, you, know, you, you, you can kind of work out the, uh, the amount of time you have to run your campaign, get a, work up an idea of what you want to do when, uh, organizing letters of support letters, letters to the editor, you know, you know, get some people lined up and you know, 
schedule those out, you know, once one this week, one next week on a weekly or a daily basis, or however, however you're going to do that. And, you know, the, uh, you know, the media, you know, the, the Grafton News, Grafton Common, the community advocate may have some, uh, some guidelines for when they will accept candidate endorsement letters and when they will publish them. So you have to be aware of all that, factor that all into your timeline. Uh, events that you may want to attend. Granted, during a, during the, the pandemic, there probably aren't many events you're going to be attending in person. Uh, in other years, you know, you know, you want to look for events that you're going to be attending in person and schedule around that. This year, whatever thing, you know, there may, there may not be events you will attend in person, but there may be Zoom meetings you want to participate in. Uh, you, you may want to organize some events, some, you know, Zoom get-togethers for friends and family, you know, sort of like, you know, in normal times, we would do a coffee hour at somebody's house. Uh, you know, in pandemic times, we might want to do something similar via Zoom. Uh, the, 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 there's all the things that you might want to get done in your campaign. You, you really have to, you know, sort of plan that out and schedule them and make sure that everything's going to be ready when you need it to be ready and that you're not over overbooked, uh, or you're not spending a week doing nothing when you really should be doing something. You, you definitely have to think about that. And again, it helps to have somebody who's going to going to help you organize and manage that timeline. So I'm hearing you talk a lot about the need for a team and a lot of coordination. It isn't. It is a lot of work. Um, it can be a lot of fun, I think, and then I hope it's rewarding. Um, Raul is saying that he has, doesn't feel like he's had a normal com school committee year because COVID has just taken over all of the school decisions. <laughs> so he's looking forward to doing what he intended to do. <laughs> but <laughs> we are, we are. <laughs> uh, I would like you each to do a little bit of um, encouragement, not only for people who have already decided, but also for people who might run in the future uh, about what it is to serve as a uh, elected official or a volunteer in town. Maybe I can start because I am totally new in this okay. thing. Uh, I have to tell you, I was very skeptical about it. I had no idea how it is, but I went forward with that. And trust me, it's not all that difficult. It feels good to be part of the town. Yes. I mean, from start to finish, I, I mean, luckily I didn't have to run a campaign and I didn't have to do finances, but if you have a team and if Grafton is not that big of a town, everyone knows pretty much quite a few people, everyone is willing to help you, every single one. You can talk to anyone from the select board to school committee or planning board, everyone is ready to help you out. And it's not that difficult. The, the most difficult part I would say is to pull the papers, just to decide. And if someone feels, oh, I don't have any experience, oh, I, I don't want to be part of that. I don't want to go on these meetings every, every two weeks. It's not difficult at all. It's not difficult and you will feel good when you feel that you're part of the town and you are giving your time to the town. You're helping the town get better with time. Sure. Um, I have to say, you know, running for office is one of the most humbling and rewarding experiences I think anyone can ever do. You're, you're asking people who you don't may not know to um, support you uh, in your advocacy for this town. I mean, all of us for all intent and purposes are volunteers, okay? Um, and we devote a lot of time uh, and effort. And I know people who I've served with um, in the past and the present, they, they all love it. They relish in it. it. It's something that it is a calling for you. And if you have the slightest interest in wanting to serve in that capacity, uh, I would be the first person waiting in line to sign your nomination papers, you know, safely as possible, obviously. Uh, but, you know, you're having that enthusiasm and getting those signatures is, is, is just rewarding. It, it just, it, it builds on that um, part of, you know, getting outside of your comfort zone and getting to know people, like Rahul said, like, you know, he says, this town does have a lot of people who know one another. You know, we're a town of 
19,000 people. Um, and, you know, it's impossible to know everybody, but, you know, there's enough of us out there that have known a lot of people who come out and vote in local elections every year. And um, to your point, Rahul, um, Rahul that, that, that is, um, you know, that's important for candidates to really kind of get to know and branch out to know those people so they can get introductions. Um, you know, that again, it's through the, it's through, you know, you know, social engineering, you know what I mean? And also using, you know, all the tools necessary. Like I said, doing all these activities, like David talked about with the timeline, having a team of people and, and, and you know, and running the campaign, it gets very, very exciting. And, and, it, and, it, and it does, when it comes down to the wire, you know, it gets nerve wracking. I'm not going to lie to you. No, no one here likes to, no one here likes to lose. <laughs> okay. But, you know, at some, at some times when you have a contested race, that's a very real possibility. You just have to be prepared, but also be encouraged. Don't, don't go into despair if things don't work out right the first time. Come back. I've known, we've known many people who've come back year after year after year and after their third, fourth time running, they, they finally get elected. Um, so it's, it, if you're that interested in, in, you know, you're, you're, you've got the, um, you know, you've got the, you got the itch to, to, to serve your community. Uh, just keep at it and um, don't, don't let uh, little setbacks get you down. Just keep, stay the course. Yeah. But I'd, I'd like to put in a word of encouragement for you know, anybody who is watching this or, or listening to this or thinking about it is uh, we have of all the, of all the people that help this town run uh, of the, the unpaid you know, the volunteers on boards and committees and commissions, uh, relatively few of us are elected, relatively few of those positions are elected. That's right. Uh, and, uh, but there are dozens upon dozens upon dozens of positions that are unelected and we always have vacancies on committees. So if you think you might be interested in the future in running for elective office, uh, you don't, you know, that you don't have to start out that way. I didn't. I mean, uh, I did try for election fairly early in my active involvement in town, but you know, I've been pretty pretty much steadily involved for a good many years, and and I, I, I do find it pretty rewarding. But you know, you can also see there there are some of us who wear quite a few different hats, uh, and there's but there's a lot of other places, and and I, I learned long ago that I couldn't do everything that I was interested in doing, so I just didn't have enough time. But I. I I do, I do uh, would like to encourage people, particularly younger folks, yes. uh, to, uh, you know, to he help make Grafton a better place. There's a lot of ways you can serve Grafton. And some of them may not seem very significant, but we run, the town runs on volunteer efforts. And we need people to be interested in getting involved and there's a good chance that you're going to find that when you get involved in this committee or that committee, uh, you, you get to know a whole lot more about how the town works. Uh, you, you over time, you maybe you maybe learn about different things. You find uh, a, a place, uh, a role that you find particularly interesting. You think you could do well at, and quite often that will lead you to an elected position that you want to run for. Uh, and and uh, but the more and the more you, the more you do, you know, the more you volunteer for the town, the more comfortable you get. You know, either you find that this really isn't what I want to do. It's not for me. And then some people do. They 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 get involved. They find you know this really it, it's not up my alley. So fine, you can learn. You, know, you you try it out. You learn what you learn what you can and can I do. You learn what you are and are not interested in. But the more people, the more people that take an interest, the better off we are as a town and we'll get people, you know, we, we need a, a, a steady influx of you know, new, new faces on some of these boards because some of us are getting older. Uh, maybe not all of us, but I know some of us are getting older and uh, we're not going to be around forever. And, uh, you know, we, we do need people to continue to take an interest to get to continue to get involved. And some of you who would get involved will sooner or later, find yourself running for elective office. I'd like to add to what you have said by saying that the league definitely supports contested uh, elections. It makes us a better democracy. And I have sometimes heard that people don't run because they don't want to run against their friend or somebody they know, <laughs> because it is a small town. And I'd like to say that we're hoping and the league very much supports ranked choice voting. 
that if we have ranked choice voting, that will be less of a concern because I want we want our democracy to be inclusive of lots of different ideas and we don't want people stepping back um, at, because they don't want to contest somebody that they know or whatever. We want everybody involved. <laughs> I'll, I'll vouch for that. The two, the two contested elections that I ran in and lost, we were the four, the, it was four candidates for two seats both times. And, and we were all on good terms with one yeah. another. We did, we did not view it as a bitter contest. Uh, and, and that's the way it should be. Locally, you know, at, at, at other levels, it's a little different. But, but here in Grafton, we're all, we're all part of the same town. I think we're all interested in the, in the same thing. And we, we can take a contested election, at least Absolutely. most of us, and, and, and keep it on a friendly basis. We're not going to get better. We'll congratulate the winners and we'll Civic, have a good time doing it. Civic dialogue. That's just an awesome thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any last thoughts? I want to thank you. I, again, have learned things. And hey, Karen, yes, I, um, I, I looked up the date for that candidates night and oh, good. Sunday, April 25th. All right, good girl. <laughs> so, yep, I found it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate the invitation tonight. Have a good one.